Hi, my name is Patrick Brown. I am the Purchasing Director with the City of Flagstaff. I am joined today by Stacy Salzberg, our City Clerk, and Joanne Keene, our Deputy City Manager. In this video, we will be giving brief summaries regarding each of the propositions you will be seeing on the ballot in the upcoming November election as presented by the City of Flagstaff. Before we dive into the propositions, Stacy will take a few moments to give a little information about the ballot and the process for voting. Stacy, All right, thank you, Patrick. Hello, everyone. The election will be held on November 7th, 2023. This election is a little bit different. It is a ballot by mail election, which means that there will be no polling places to vote at on election day. A ballot will be mailed to each registered voter in the city of Flagstaff. After filling out your ballot, you can mail it using the envelope that came with your ballot, or you can drop it off at one of the drop boxes located around the city. For more information about ballot box locations or the election, you can refer to the publicity pamphlet or the city's website. Joanne, would you like to talk a little bit about what a city charter is? Sure. Well, thanks, Stacy. So a city charter is the basic law of the city as established by voters. The charter defines the powers and functions of the city and serves as the foundation of government for, sit for the city. The charter sets the governance structure, defines the qualifications and role of elected officials, and establishes the authority and responsibility of city officers, among other things. The city charter may be preempted to the extent it conflicts with state, federal, or judicial law, and all amendments to the city charter require voter approval, which is why we're here before you today. The Flagstaff City Charter was first adopted in 1958 and has been amended eight times, with the latest amendments coming in 2015. Amendments you will be hearing about in this presentation were identified by an internal staff committee. Many of the amendments are administrative or technical in an effort to bring the charter more in line with current practices or changes in state law. They improve efficiencies and standardize operations within the organization, and they clean up outdated practices or language. Stacy, I'll turn it back to you. Great, thank you, Joanne. So let's go ahead and jump into the charter amendments that you'll be seeing on your ballot. Proposition 461, relates to the nomination requirements for primary election. To qualify as a city council candidate in Flagstaff, a person must collect a minimum number of petition signatures from citizens. Currently, the signature requirement for citizens to qualify for placement on the ballot is a minimum of 5% of the voters who voted at the last preceding general election. You can see here the minimum number of signatures a person must get for the upcoming 2024 election and the last three candidate elections over the last few years. This can be a tall order for candidates. State law allows for city council to adopt an ordinance that can set the minimum number of signatures required to 1,000 or 5%, whichever is less. Flagstaff has not been able to utilize this option because the charter has set a specific requirement for signatures. This amendment would allow the city council to utilize this alternative if they would like. Also included in Proposition 461 is updating the charter to align the dates that candidates can file their nomination paperwork with state law. The way it is currently written is out of compliance with state law, and the proposed amendment would update the language so that it references the time period as set by state law. This provides for flexibility as that law may change over time. Okay, Patrick, I'm going to turn it over to you for our next proposition. Thank you, Stacy. So the next proposition is Proposition 462 in regards to purchases, contracts, and city improvements. Proposition 462 is amending Article 7 of the city charter to increase the formal threshold from $50,000 to $100,000 and to update procurement language to reflect best practices. Significant inflationary increases over the years have impacted the cost of routine supplies, materials, equipment, services, and city improvements. Manufacturer pricing has also become inconsistent and unstable, and quoted pricing is expiring before the contract can be approved. The formal procurement process requires additional months to process and may result in delay of service or inability for the vendor to honor pricing or provide goods. An increase in the threshold will allow the city to secure those needed items more quickly. Procurements under the $100,000 threshold 
must still go through an internal process that includes competitive solicitations or proposals and multiple or multi-level approvals. And now I'll turn it back over to Stacy for Proposition 463. Proposition 463 relates to administrative residency requirements. Currently, the city charter requires the deputy city managers, the city clerk, the city treasurer, and the city attorney to live within the official limits of the city of Flagstaff. This proposed amendment will remove that requirement for these five positions and allow those who hold those positions to live outside the official city limits. Amending the charter to remove this requirement could enhance the city's ability to attract and hire qualified employees because there are more housing and neighborhood options. It would also encourage career advancement internally if an employee is not faced with having to change their current residence to promote to one of these positions. This does not necessarily mean that the employees who hold these positions would live a significant distance from Flagstaff. Employees are required to live within the state of Arizona, and they must physically report to work three days per week as directed in our flexible work schedule directive. This amendment um, would not apply to the city manager, who will still be required to live within the official boundaries of the city of Flagstaff, as is prescribed in another section of the city charter. With that, I'm going to turn it back over to you, Patrick. Thank you, Stacy. Proposition 464 is regarding procurement methods. Proposition 464 is an amendment to the city charter that updates the procurement method by revising language from bidding to procurement. The city currently uses multiple procurement methods for obtaining city improvements, supplies, materials, equipment, and services needed for city operations and programs. Bidding is just one type of procurement method the city uses. When the city charter was originally drafted, the bidding procurement method was the only method utilized. Since then, there have been additional methods established by state law and state procurement to the Arizona State Procurement Manual, which are utilized by the city of Flagstaff. This amendment updates the charter to reflect multiple procurement methods used today. And now I'm going to talk about Proposition 465 in regards to leases and sale of real city properties. This proposed charter amendment would give the city council authority to lease or sell real property to, such as land or buildings to someone other than the highest responsible bidder. As revised, the city charter would enable solicitations to consider factors beyond price when selling or leasing real property. The amendment will provide greater flexibility in leasing real property. The city often wants to lease land or buildings for specific purposes that benefits the community. This amendment is being proposed to reflect the practice of allowing use of buildings or community services versus simply for the highest price. The proposed charter amendment would give city council more flexibility and allow requests for proposals for community uses when leasing land or buildings. The amendment also provides greater flexibility when selling land or buildings. The city would often like to consider creative proposals for use and not just the highest price. For example, a proposal may include an offer to reserve an affordable housing restriction or conservation easement over all or part of the land being sold. Or a proposal may include an offer to construct a community amenity such as pocket park or trail within a proposed development as a condition of sale. Or a proposal may include a commitment to develop or use land or buildings for specific purposes. Now I'd like to talk about Proposition 466 in regards to procurement language. The proposed amendment is again revising the charter to update language for procurement best practices. The charter currently identifies only one type of procurement through a bidding process. The city currently uses multiple procurement methods for obtaining city improvements, supplies, materials, equipment, and services needed for city operations and programs. Bidding is just one type of procurement method the city uses. When the city charter was originally drafted, the bidding procurement method was the only method utilized. Since then, there have been additional methods established by state law and procurement code through the Arizona State Procurement Manual, which are utilized by the city of Flagstaff today. 
This amendment updates the city charter to reflect the multiple procurement methods used today. And now I'll turn it over to Joanne for Proposition 467. Great. Well, thanks, Patrick. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about Proposition 467, which relates to personnel rules and regulations. Proposition 467 relates to the city's personnel rules and regulations. Currently, the city council establishes the personnel rules and regulations. The proposed amendment would authorize the city manager to establish the personnel rules and regulations, which is more in line with the council manager form of government. This will allow for a more responsive organization than that can adjust to current situations and needs quickly. It will also consolidate all rules, regulations, and policies. City Council will continue to provide direction and feedback to the city manager on policies of interest to them, and they will approve any changes as they relate to the classification, compensation, merits, and benefits of employees through the budget process. Also included in this amendment is the removal of volunteers from the list of those subject to council control, except board and commission members, which is consistent with regular practice. The amendment also updates the outdated reference of police judge to presiding magistrate. Stacy, I'll turn it back over to you to talk about Proposition 468. Great. Thank you, Joanne. The Proposition 468 relates to actions that, that are taken by ordinance. The proposed amendment would clarify that an ordinance is only required to authorize acquisition, sale, or exchange of public real property in fee simple. This is where title to the land will be transferred. It would clarify that an ordinance is not required to authorize acquisition, sale, or exchange of property interests that are less than fee simple, so things like easements. The City Council will still have to take formal action in a public meeting to transfer those lesser property interests, such as easements. However, it would be by a resolution versus an ordinance. A resolution is a more efficient action because it is effective immediately, allowing transfers to happen more expeditiously. The proposed amendment would also eliminate the need for an ordinance to authorize the city to borrow money. Removing the language, the authorization to borrow money, would still require formal city council action in a public meeting to borrow that money. However, as with the previous item, um, it would be by a resolution versus an ordinance. A resolution provides increased efficiencies to issue new debt, by reducing the time frame between the city council approval and the completion of the borrowing transaction. In periods of rising interest rates, it's important to have the ability to complete the transactions quickly, to lock in those interest rates, and to issue the debt. Joanne, I'm gonna kick it back to you to talk about our boards and commissions. Great, thanks, Stacy. So uh, Proposition 469, Currently, the city charter requires that all appointed members of boards and commissions live within the boundaries of the city of Flagstaff. This amendment would allow non-city residents to serve on some boards and commissions as determined by city council. The number of seats available to non-city residents will also be determined by the city council through the ordinance. Many of the city's commissions have struggled to maintain a full roster. This keeps them from meeting regularly and fulfilling their duties. This amendment would expand participation in the board and commission program to those who do not live within the formal city boundary, but who actively participate in and are part of the larger Flagstaff community. Non-resident community members have frequently inquired about participating on boards and commissions as a way to get involved and support so now I'll talk a little bit about Proposition 470, which deals with facilities in excess of $1 million. This section of the charter determines when the purchase or construction of a municipal facility must be approved by voters. Currently, if the purchase or construction of a city facility is more than approximately $2.95 million, it must get voter approval. This requirement would add years to the purchase or construction of a city, city facility. 
If the city has the cash funding in place, the city council could approve the purchase and or construction of a facility efficiently through the public process. This could save time and reduce cost due to inflation and rising construction costs. The proposed amendment would eliminate the requirement for voter approval for all city facilities. If the amendment is approved, there would continue to be a public process on the purchase or construction of city facilities. The charter requires purchases of property to be approved by an ordinance adopted by the city council and the annual city budget process also identifies when a new municipal facility is needed for city council consideration. If city council agrees, it is formally adopted as part of the annual budget and each of these actions are taken in public meetings. Okay, now I'll turn to Proposition 471, the issuance of bonds. The city charter dictates that the city shall not issue or authorize issuance of any bonds that pledges city tax revenues, with some exceptions, without an election and approval by voters. State law is a little different in that it only requires cities to have an election for any debt that will be paid back through secondary property taxes. There are no requirements for voter approval on other types of debt issuances. Those are left to the discretion of the city council. Amendment number one in our charter would cause delays in project delivery and increase the cost of the project. And it could also affect the city's ability to obtain the best interest rate for the debt financing. It passed Proposition 471 would eliminate the requirement for voter approval on sales tax backed bond issues. The city council is required to authorize the issuance of any debt obligations in a public meeting. In addition, the consideration of new debt obligations is part of the public annual budget process. Stacy, I'll turn it over to you to talk about Proposition 472. Thank you, Joanne. Proposition 472 is related to franchise elections. Um, this particular proposition is a bit of a cleanup item. Currently, the city charter specifies that a special franchise election can be called with a 30-day notice. The call of all elections must be done in accordance with state law, which provides ample time and notice to the public and election officials. Currently, the legally required time frame to call any election is 180 days in advance. This amendment represents a minor revision that will bring the city charter requirement to call a franchise election into compliance with state law, and the new language would provide the flexibility should state law change in the future. I will now go on to talk about Proposition 473, um, which has to do with the final read of ordinances on the same day as first read. City Council ordinances require two reads before adoption. Typically, there is a two-week period between the first reading and the second reading of an ordinance. This provides time for both the City Council and the public to consider the effects of the ordinance before it is adopted. Currently, the City Charter allows for the first reading, second reading, and adoption of an ordinance to occur at the same Council meeting where it is first presented and forego the two-week period in between if there is a unanimous vote of the City Council members present at the meeting. This means if there are four members of the city council in attendance, it only requires four affirmative votes for the ordinance to move forward. The proposed amendment will set a higher standard by requiring the affirmative vote of three fourths of all members elected or appointed to the city council to read an ordinance for the first and second time and adopt at the same meeting, again, foregoing that two week period in between. This means that regardless of how many members of City Council are in attendance at the meeting, the action would require the affirmative vote of at least six members of Council um, to make this change um, to the normal process. Whether the City Council approves an ordinance in one meeting or in more than one meeting, there is a 30-day referral period before the ordinance goes into effect unless an emergency is declared. This will remain in place should this amendment pass. I'm going to turn it over to Joanne to talk about Proposition 474. Thank you, Stacy. So Proposition 474 relates to the administration of adopted tax code. 
This amendment proposes to bring the charter more in line with recent legislative changes to the model city tax code, which includes recent emphasis on tax simplification. The amendment will also more clearly define the ability of the city council to self-administer the adopted tax code. The proposed amendment affirms the city's desire to maintain local control over its own budget, taxation, financial, and fiscal powers to the extent not otherwise preempted by federal or state law. It also affirms city council authority to adopt ordinances to provide for local taxation, such as local sales tax, use taxes, and property taxes. I'm going to turn it over to Patrick to talk about Proposition 475. Thank you, Joanne. I am now going to talk to you about Proposition 475 in regards to the sale of city personal property. Currently, the city charter allows for the sale of real and personal property owned by the city that is no longer needed. Clarification is needed to identify the types of items that are determined to be surplus property. The proposed amendment would clarify the per disposal process for surplus personal property, such as equipment and materials, and the disposal process for real property, such as land and buildings, are not the same. The provision about the disposal of real property, such as land and buildings, will be relocated to a separate section of the Charter, and that I spoke about in Proposition 465. All the provisions related to the sale of real property, such as land and buildings, are in one section of the Charter. The proposed amendment would then only address disposal of personal property, such as equipment and materials, and it would allow for personal property valued at less than $1,000 versus the $500 currently in the Charter to be disposed of without the need for a public auction. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Stacy for Proposition 476. Thank you, Patrick. Proposition 476 um, relates to physical requirements for our records. Currently, the Charter requires that three physical copies of the City Code and any declared public records must be stored and maintained permanently. This provision within the Charter was based on prior state law that required three copies of these documents to be kept. State law has since changed and now allows for one physical copy and one digital copy to be stored and maintained. Sufficient and adequate storage has been an issue, and reducing the number of physical copies that the city is required to keep will help extend our storage capacity um, that we currently have. So this amendment um, is fairly straightforward. Um, it would remove the requirement to maintain those three physical copies and allow for us to adapt as technologies advance and state law changes to accommodate those. Joanne, I'll turn it to you. Great, thanks, Stacey. Um, I'd like to talk about Proposition 477. The City Charter allows the City Council to create a cash basis fund, which is used to set aside financial resources to assist in meeting future obligations should a City Fund need the financial support. Ordinance 466 was adopted by City Council on September 8, 1959. Based on research, there were only a few times the fund was used between 1959 and 1967. The city does not use a cash basis fund today, and the last reference to the cash basis fund was reported in the audit report for the year ending June 30, 1967. The city has a number of financial policies in place to ensure that all financial obligations are met. The cash basis fund is an old mechanism that is no longer used in the city's financial structure. The proposed amendment will eliminate this section of the city charter to reflect current practice. Stacey, I'll turn it back over to you for Proposition 478. Great. Thank you, Joanne. Proposition 478 relates to our municipal court and magistrate terminology. Um, this is another cleanup item. The current charter references outdated language for city courts and judges. The reference to police court or police judge is antiquated, and it is not representative of our current facilities or our positions. This amendment uh, will update the terminology within the charter to reflect the appropriate designations of municipal court and magistrate. Our next proposition, and our last one, 
um, is Proposition 479 related to failure to vote. The city charter requires all members of city council to vote on matters before them. Should a member of city council decide not to vote, their vote is considered and entered into the record as a yes vote. There is an exception noted in this section of the charter that a member of council does not have to vote on matters involving their own official conduct. However, the charter does not provide an exception for times when a member of council may have declared a conflict of interest. When a member of city council determines a conflict of interest exists and declares a conflict of interest, they must refrain from voting. Adding an exception into the charter would avoid the record reflecting a yes vote by that member of city council. So this is another minor amendment to the charter that not only reflects best practices, but it brings the charter in line with state law as it relates to conflict of interest, and it provides an exception for a time when the member of council may not be able to vote due to a declared conflict of interest. And that brings us to the end of our presentation. Thank you for watching. We hope you have gained a good understanding of the Charter Amendment propositions. If you would like additional details, please take a look at our website at www.flagstaff.az.gov elections. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.